Good evening, everybody. I see that we've got um, at least 130 people, including officers, on the uh, on this chat, which is excellent news. It shows how important this subject is to you. And I hope um, the fact that we're having this conversation in open forum gives you some confidence of how important this is a uh, situation for the council and for the police. Um, I'm going to just give you some household hints, well, not household hints and tips. No, that's not right. Is it? Housekeeping rules, that's the thing. Um, so, a um, few event rules that I need to highlight. Um, this event is being recorded and will be published after the event on the Council website. Um, all attendees, other than the panel, are muted. If you wish to speak, now, when we went in, you would have seen please raise your hand. However, what, what happens if we do the please raise your hand is there's no way of knowing who raised their hand first and who's raised their hand after somebody else and it all gets terribly messy. So what I would like to suggest, and if we can keep to this rule, is really important because we tried it, we've just done one in Twickenham of these things. And if you've got a question, just type question. That's all you need to type. You don't need to type the question, just type question in the chat function. And then I'll see everybody in order coming down. And that makes it really clear as to who's been there. But what happened in the Twickenham one is that people were making comments and having conversations and all sorts of things. And I missed a couple of people and they got quite shirty towards the end because I hadn't drawn their question out. So please just, if all you need to do is type question and I will make sure that I come down the list to you. I will try to do everybody at least once. So um, if you've got a question which is burning, make it your first one, make it count. That's the way forward. So, um, all attendees, you will have been sent the event etiquette. Um, I'm sure that this won't need to happen, but um, we need everybody to be respectful of speakers. But if there is sort of lack of respect to speakers or other um, uh, question setters, then we, we might need to mute or remove participants. Um, the event staff will do this, so you don't need to worry about it yourself. Um, if there are any problems, we'll communicate with individuals via the chat or by inviting them into an adjoining virtual discussion. Okay, so this evening, um, joining us for this discussion, we have the ward councillors for South Richmond. That's uh, Councillor Peter Buckwell, Councillor Pam Fleming, and Councillor Bill Newton Dunn. We have the, um, the, the borough commander, Chief Superintendent Sally Benatar. We have the um, neighbourhoods inspector, Inspector Rebecca Robinson from Richmond Police. We have Councillor Julia Needham Watts, who is our um, committee chair for the Environment Committee. We have Councillor Richard Baker, who is our lead member for business. We have our director of the environment, Paul Chadwick, the assistant director of the environment, Ishbel Murray. We have our head of community safety for Richmond Council, that's Robin Thomas. And we have a representative from Park Guard, Joe Lazone. So we, we have assembled um, a knowledgeable, experienced panel for you to put your questions to, um, if that's not terrible English, uh, to whom to put your questions. There you are. Um, so this is a really important issue. And it's, I, I am as upset as any of you that we are having to hold this type of meeting. Um, unfortunately, we're finding ourselves in <coughs> a developing situation which is by no means unique to Richmond. It's not even unique to London. If you'd seen the, the scenes in, on the news yesterday about Bournemouth Beach, that was only half of it. What was also happening, I understand from radio reports, is that later on in the evening, people were driving down to the beach from London where they were having all night beach parties. It's, this isn't a, a Richmond or even Richmond town or even Richmond borough centric issue, but it's something we're determined to do what we can to get on top of. Today, I'm not going to have all of the answers for you. Sally's not going to have all the answers for you from the police, but we will try to answer your questions and we will try to offer up the thinking and, sol and solutions that we've got going on. So I'm going to stop talking for just a little bit because I've gone on for quite long enough. And I'm going to ask Sally Benatar, Chief Superintendent Sally Benatar, and uh, Rebecca Robinson, Inspector Rebecca Robinson, to give an overview of the situation from a policing point of view. Thank you, Councillor Roberts, uh, and thank you for inviting me and to everybody who's attended. Uh, I'm Sally Benatar, I'm, I'm the Borough Commander 
um, for Richmond and I also look after Kingston, Merton and Wandsworth as well. Um, I recognise um, some of you on the call um, from uh, previous contacts and also from the, the correspondence that we've had this week. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're here to listen and to explain to you um, what we are doing um, with regards to, to policing and community safety in Richmond, uh, together with, um, with, with council partners. Um, I'm not going to be at all defensive. Um, you, uh, you have all, you're all here to tell us how you are feeling. Um, we're committed to putting out as many police officers and community support officers on patrol, um, whether it's to respond to emergencies or, or neighbourhood policing, or patrols in parks uh, and open spaces at the moment. Um, and we, we are revising our resourcing plans all the time, um, certainly for this weekend, adding more people in as we're able to mobilise them. And I'll give you a little bit of context about what's happening in, in London as well. Um, we always have a policing plan for Richmond. We always have neighbourhood officers and emergency response detectives um, as well. And, and I, I do hear that some of you have said to us, um, you know, you, you, you don't see enough police. Um, this weekend um, across London, we are, we're seeing a few things happening. Um, since the, the lockdown started, uh, we've been trying to get our approach right in terms of how we police it, do we, how do we enforce it, and how do we encourage people to stick with the health protection legislation. And as that lockdown has eased and then other things has, have happened, the, uh, the tragic death of George Floyd, the protests, uh, which have meant that we have had to send our Southwest police officers into Westminster to protect, um, prote protect uh, central London. Um, and now with the weather and, and the position that we're in with the, the pubs uh, selling alcohol, but not um, are being open and, and, and also the, the old, all the issues that you know about antisocial behaviour um, as a result of that. So this weekend we have more officers on duty um, in the evenings, so we have them on duty all day specifically patrolling certain parks and open spaces and but they're not there um, permanently 24 hours in, in, uh, you know, in, a, in a particular park or open space and I will be quite open with you that we, we don't have enough police officers um, on the Southwest Command Unit to have permanent dedicated officers in every one of the parks and open spaces and the greens um, that are um, attracting this, anti this level of antisocial behaviour, gatherings, music, um, drinking, um, etc. So we, we, I can't commit to you to have um, officers there all the time but we have um, more officers than we, than we usually resource by because we've cancelled their days off and extended their shifts. We're bringing in more special constables working with British Transport Police um, and we are focusing them on the areas. So you will see officers on patrol in, in Richmond, um, in, in, by the riverside, um, or on the green, in, in other areas that, that you have mentioned. Um, so the reason I don't want to give you specific numbers now, although I, I will say that we will have, um, we, we, we work in terms of serials, uh, that means groups of one sergeant and six constables, so we will be mobilising um, across the four boroughs at, at least three serials um, all, all the way through the weekend um, in, in the later parts of the day. Um, and, and into the early hours to respond. So they're a mobile response. And, and then in addition, obviously, we do have our neighbourhood officers. So you, you may be aware that every ward in Richmond Borough has two neighbourhood police officers. We call them dedicated ward officers and a one community support officer. Now, at the moment, because this, um, this disorder and antisocial behaviour in other parts of London is, uh, is, is causing some risk, some of our officers have to go to other places. So Inspector Robinson and I, we've managed to get our, our Richmond and Twickenham uh, teams to stay on the Southwest at the moment for this weekend. But I, I can't give a guarantee that what we have in place now, and we do have significantly more resources, um, uh, and we, we get them, uh, with, you know, just constantly reviewing it now. So I've got a team of people now looking at who's on duty, what shifts they're on. Um, 
uh, but it will change, which is why I, I, I don't want, I know that the, you want to have specific numbers, you want to know exactly who you can expect from what times, and I just can't give you that, that detailed information. What I can say to you is, um, we, we triage all the calls that come in. So I'm very aware that you, you report to us and you don't always get an officer deployed immediately. Um, and what we do in these cases, because at the moment we have so many different calls from residents to gatherings, whether it's seven people or 30 people or 100 people and, and whatever it is they're doing, we can't deploy to every single one. So we risk assess it and we triage it. And that's where we, we look at you know, what, what is happening, what is the crime linked to it, um, where is the risk? So where we can, we will deploy. And I do expect that you will see a lot more, um, you, you'll, you'll see officers on, on the riverside and, and my colleagues from the council will talk about the park guard as well. Um, in London, it's, it's tense at the moment. Um, we've had a, a couple of weeks of protests. We had uh, some violent disorder on Wednesday in Brixton. Uh, which started as a party, as a gathering, um, and, and the police attended. We attended because residents called us to say, this is too noisy, can you come and stop it? Uh, we were overwhelmed. Um, we were in an estate and uh, our, six of our officers from, from, um, from Richmond and Kingston boroughs were attacked and um, uh, 23 officers in total were attacked. Uh, that was in Brixton. Uh, last night was slightly calmer. Uh, there was disorder in Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, uh, officers were injured there as well. Um, we are doing what we can to scan intelligence about raves, you know, illegal <coughs> gatherings of people and to, to respond. Um, we are using the dispersal orders that we can, that we can use. We're using the legislation that we have. Uh, the reason why um, we have only put a dispersal order in place uh, for 48 hours at the moment is because that's what the legislation allows. Um, I, I appreciate that the, the, the communication about that didn't clarify that point. So of course, we will uh, look to review that. Um, we, can't, we can't put a preemptive disposal or, uh, dispersal order in. We, we, we can only do it at the time um, when we have something happening. It's not, it's not a preventative power. Um, but uh, Re Rebecca will explain more about that because she was the one that put it in last night. Um, so really what I want to say to you is that there's a couple of things going on. Um, it, it's challenging in London um, with managing disorder, but I do appreciate that you, you are not really talking so much about that. You're talking about your everyday um, quality of life, antisocial behaviour um, and, what, and what's going on in, in your neighbourhoods. and. Uh, we are very determined to put as many police out as we can um, to uh, all the time to to make sure that that is um, that it feels safe and uh, and, a, and and an attractive place to live, which I know that it is. Uh, but and and for this weekend, it is. Um, it, I anticipate again that it will be busy. Um, I'm just going to introduce Rebecca. Rebecca is our, our, our new uh, Richmond Neighbourhood Inspector. Uh, some of you will have known Simon Ross, who she's just taken over from, and uh, she will just say a, a, a short um, piece about um, how she works with her teams, and then we'll, we'll take it back to Councillor Roberts. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Rebecca Ross. I'm the new Neighbourhood Inspector. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone for dialing in. This is kind of really helpful. Uh, for me to kind of get a feel of what you're feeling in this time. Um, I want to reassure you that um, although, although I am new, my predecessor did pass on uh, the previous plans around Richmond, uh, and I am aware of uh, Richmond Riverside, Richmond Green, Richmond Hill, those issues around there. We've got a fantastic team down there who already had a plan in place for this uh, summer, which we are working through now, along with our partners. So joint patrols with our council, members uh, with Achievement of Children. I've met with the wonderful Mums Against Muggings group. Uh, hello, sorry, I think I cut out there. We lost um, you just after Mums Against Muggings, Rebecca. Sorry, I think that was a technical issue with my iPad. 
Um, so yeah, continuing to do some work with them. They're a fantastic group. I just I, I love the um, sort of the the local led initiatives, and I think Richmond is just a is just a marvelous place. And the war team are absolutely dedicated. They flex their shifts uh, in order to provide the cover, which they have done uh, this weekend. They'll actually be working extended shifts. They are really dedicated and committed uh, to Richmond. Um, and as Mom said, we've got some some additional resources, and there's a plan moving forward as we go go through the summer. But um, I don't want to go on too long, so I shall open it open it up for questions because uh, that's what we're here for to listen to you. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, before I move on, I'm going to call Vivian Harris first as the chair of the uh, Friends of Rich, uh, Richmond Green. Uh, before that, I just want to say a quick word about what the council's um, enforcement uh, approach is. Um, you'll be aware that we have something called Park Guard, which is effectively um, the, for, for want of a better term, our parks police. Um, so it's slightly more um, enhanced version of the good old fashioned park keeper. But they do have the um, powers to issue fixed penalty notices and move people on. Um, this weekend, um, We've, I've, I've authorised the uh, purchase, for want of a better word, um, four additional park guard um, operatives. And all of these things do come at a cost, but we're, we recognise that this is an important um, issue. So we've, that's going to be about um, two and a half to three thousand pounds just for the weekend, just so you're aware. And I'm going to be keeping this under review on a weekly basis. If we keep needing that additional resource, we will have that additional resource. Furthermore, um, I've, I looked at the, the shift patterns that they were originally going to do and felt that it wasn't adequate um, if from the needs that have been arising. So they, I've also authorised them to be on later shifts. Um, I'm not going to tell you what time they will clock off because <laughs> for, for very obvious reasons. We don't want to give um, people you know, advanced warning of when it will be safe, not safe, but when they can return to the green. So, but we, they are going to, there are going to be more park guard, there are going to be later park guard. We are deploying the resource that we have. Our, our, our resources are not infinite, nor moreover are the numbers of staff that park guard have got to deploy. But we are doing what we can in order to make sure that there is a uniform presence both for the police and park guard, not just on Richmond Green. We must remember that this is a phenomenon which is going on across the borough. So we've got Richmond Green, Twickenham Green, I've had reports of Moormead in St Margaret's, Ham Common is another one, smaller reports on Kew Green. So we do need to try to get that resource spread as much as possible, but we are taking steps to ensure that the resource is there. Right, uh, Vivian Harris. Um... Can I carry on? Thank you, yes, Councillor you Roberts. Not at all. Right, uh, Vivian Harris, Chair of Friends of Richmond Green. Um, quite a few of us have been here for a very long time and I think we can't remember a time as bad as this in terms of excessive uh, alcohol, uh, drug selling, taking, fights, brawls in the evenings and also the urination and defecation on a massive scale um, in our gardens, our backyards, in our drives. So I think we are certainly more than a little intimidated and scared by the actions of, uh, frankly, a small minority of the users of uh, Richmond Green. And Friends of Richmond Green would actually have put together a, a kind of a 48 hour proposal to really address these issues. And frankly, we are delighted that A, this conference is taking place, but B, also some actions have already been put in place to uh, improve the police presence uh, on the green, certainly in the next 48 hours. We've just got to give out a message that the council and the police are just not prepared to sort of accept or tolerate these current levels of antisocial behaviour, of disorder and, and drug abuse. Now, our four point plan, which uh, I did send in advance to our councillors and the police, was that we definitely need more police resources on Richmond Green. We were delighted to see more people out on Thursday night and delighted to hear what we've been told earlier on this afternoon that uh, we will have better coverage over the weekend. 
Um, we were pleased to see the dispersal order, but we've got to ask the police to use those powers of dispersion and prevention. We want to see on the spot fines for urination, defecation in public, the lighting of barbecues on the green, and certainly um, the selling of drugs. Uh, we just feel that if we've got this strong police presence in the next 48 hours, it's going to give a clear message that the council and police won't tolerate these levels of behaviour. I don't think it stops there because clearly after the 48 hours, we want to see a continued police presence, uh, subject obviously to the constraints that uh, the chief superintendent has outlined. But if we could just have a regular police presence uh, patrolling on the green, possibly create a local hub for them to uh, be based at. There is uh, a police camera van that could be used to take photographs of offenders. We could put up signage and, and police at the station to enforce the idea that you don't come into Richmond, go straight to Sainsbury's and uh, buy the alcohol and go and drink it on the green. Uh, I'm not singling out just Sainsbury's because I do think that Tesco's is equally at fault. Uh, and basically we've got to start seeing some action taken against the drug uh, sellers uh, on the green. I also think that the council has to take a bit more responsibility and I'm delighted as I say that this Zoom conference is taking place. But we'd actually expect the council to uh, take a bit more responsibility for the supply of alcohol to the green. We just look at the green the night after a fine evening, it's all Tesco bags, it's uh, the remains of bottles of beer and vast quantities of uh, a nitrous oxide, which I'm certainly not suggesting Tesco selling. We also would like to see the areas that are being used for urination and defecation uh, sanitized on a more of a frequent basis. So. Uh, just to reinforce, we're delighted to see that, that we are getting resources, that things are happening, the dispersal order. I think it's great that we put down a mark over the next 48 hours, but we need to follow it up after that. So thank, thank you. you. So, yeah, so if I, I could just come in on that. For, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivian. It's nice to meet you virtually. Um, just to sort of offer some reassurance, so it's myself that put the dispersal zone in. Uh, yesterday, I worked very closely with my counterpart inspectors uh, on the response teams. Um, so we have ensured that all officers are fully briefed around their dispersal powers. They've got the leaflets and they know what they're doing. Um, they're prepared to use that over the next 48 hours. Um, and I will be monitoring that along with the duty officers to see um, how, that is, how that is going. So I just wanted to offer you some reassurance around that. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall I mute myself again? Is that... That's I, I, I believe we've got technical... Uh, there we go. It's happened. Um, to let people know, we do have um, representatives from both Tesco and Sainsbury's joining us on this, on this call. What I'd like to do just for a while is to allow people to ask some questions so that the, the scale of the issue can start to sink in slightly with those representatives from Tesco and Sainsbury's. Um, by, by hearing more personal stories, I think that that's the way forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start go, making a quick move down through the questions. Uh, Rob, you asked a question about what happens when the dispersal order is, is well, when it ends. And I think that that one's been answered. If I'm, I'm happy to unmute you so that you can just say, yes, I've, I've, I've had a satisfactory answer, if that's okay. What do you think? You could have some more details, because, um, well, first of all, thanks for Rebecca to put it in place. And uh, Sally said it's going to be reviewed, but um, I'm a little unclear about actually the details of what it means in terms of time of day gets enacted and what size group gets dispersed uh, when it ends. Um, but the main thing is, what are the triggers to making it happen after the like nine o'clock ish on on Saturday? Okay, so I can see ten o'clock and eleven o'clock on Saturday potentially being quite bad, and then during the week and next weekend if the weather's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Unfortunately, the, the power is valid for forty-eight hours, um, which is why we were initially looking at having it 
Friday, um, but there was cause and it was justified to put it in yesterday. We can review it um, as soon as it's up uh, Saturday. So I'll be working closely with my sergeants tomorrow evening around that um, if we need to put another one in. But obviously it's not something we can do uh, on a roll basis. Um, but we can, by all means, it won't be a case of just to reassure you at nine o'clock on Saturday, that's it, and everyone can, you know, not be dispersed. Um, yeah, so, and that will, yeah, those decisions will be with me and my sergeants. Um, yeah. I, and we're prepared for that. I think it's worth noting, and I, I, you may agree or disagree indeed, yeah. Rebecca, but um, the, the existing powers of the um, antisocial behaviour public space protection order already give the council and the police quite strong powers to move people on if they are yeah. causing a nuisance. Yeah, so again, I've, um, all of my teams are briefed um, on that because um, it gives the power around the seizing of uh, alcohol, um, mm. which has worked, which has worked quite well this week. Uh, the response teams have all been briefed around those powers as well. Excellent, thank and you. And that has worked in terms of moving people on because Good. people don't want to lose their alcohol. Absolutely. Excellent. So, um, Anna, Anna Steck, you have a question. And we're about to unmute you, and it, it, it takes them a couple of minutes to find you. There you go. Hello. Um, yes, I have a business on Richmond Hill, and I live on Richmond Hill, and I speak for many of the residents now. We are absolutely fed up with all these cyclists that come zooming down a one-way street at great speed and when is this going to stop or what can we do about it? I can't personally do anything about it, but um, yeah. And then when I sort of say, look, this is not allowed, I get a whole mouthful of abuse. Um, and this has all been accentuated since lockdown. Okay, uh, Rebecca, do you have a, or Sally, a quick response to that one? Uh, I will. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry that you're receiving abuse for that. It, I know the, I know exactly where you mean. Um, we're working closely with our cycle safety team um, in Richmond at the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll make contact with them to um, come do some. They, they used, there. yeah. There used to be um, people patrolling that, and they were fined on the spot. But now they know they can absolutely get away with it. And the other day, I saw a child that was nearly wiped out. It's going to end in a tragedy. It's an important issue. And I'm sure that it's something that if, if you haven't, I'm sure you will have done because they're, they're, they're very good board councillors. But if you've not got in contact with Pam or uh, Peter or Bill yet, I would strongly recommend that you take this up with them. Thank you. Not at all. Okay, so uh, Felicity uh, Parkers, again, is see, it, it, I think that possibly answers have been given to your question, but of course, you shall be the judge of that. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Hello. Hello, Gareth. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity of the call. I'm uh, co-chair with Barbara Lingle Elliott of Mothers Against Mugging, so I've met Rebecca and had the pleasure of meeting Sally as well. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All the great work you're doing. Um, I was actually on Richmond Green um, last Saturday with some friends uh, around mid-afternoon and, you know, the weather was lovely and there was a lot of people out, which was fantastic. I could see the situation was going to escalate, though, and, you know, I could sense that in the time that I was sitting there, which was mid-afternoon. And so the pictures and the videos that I got sent overnight on Sunday night weren't a surprise to me at all so I, I guess my 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 thought with all of this was you know as part of the keeping safe Richmond working group back in early May we had a, a call at the time to talk about Boris's um, plans to ease the lockdown in early July so we knew back then that our children and our people of the community were going to be let out of their houses potentially in July and we started thinking about what interventions we could put in place to ensure safety and one of them was you know to get the youth bus back on Richmond Green just to create a presence of authority 
mm -hmm. on that space. And so I wonder if we can, and, and we are pushing to get the money for that to happen in July, but I wonder if we can make a commitment, even just for this weekend and the next, just to put a stamp on that green bit of grass by having a large police vehicle there in the middle of the green where the police can sort of walk from, you know, to do their patrols. Is it possible to do that? Because I think if we, if we do that this weekend, it will, it will show and stamp like what Vivian said, that we are taking this seriously and that there is a, a physical presence of authority in our town. I think, thank you, Felicity. Uh, thank you, Felicity. I think you might have uh, had a sneaky peek at my uh, tactical plan because we've got um, the CCTV um, van that we're going to be using, um, and that was exactly what we were what we were thinking regarding it. Um, but thank you very much for all the the work Mums Against Muggings are, are doing. I'm looking forward to doing some more some more work with you. Excellent. So that so that. Um, dirty great big CCTV van is going to be parked plum spang in the middle of the I, I have it... no objection to that I mean the friend <laughs> Vivian what do you reckon you're the friends of the green <laughs> give the thumbs up or thumbs down like that if, you, if you're muted that's all excellent yeah I mean it is about I would mention that it's required Vivian. somewhere else yeah that's well, what I was and, just and, and, you know I want to I want to be, manage your expectations oh. We, of course yeah. we want you to have it on Richmond Green because we know that it is a good visible deterrent but um, we <laughs> I'm not going to talk about um, you know the the state of our resources because this isn't the the right forum for that and I, and I don't want to do that but we only have one bus for, for, for four boroughs and um, we may need to move it somewhere else um, but we, at the moment, the plan is that it will be in Richmond Green, or it will be in Richmond in, in the place that's most appropriate for it. So, uh, we, you know, we are listening yeah. to what you say. I, I wish we had enough of a fleet of vehicles, marked police vehicles, where I, we could park them in all the different places as a deterrent. Um, in, in the same way, I would love to have more people there permanently, uh, but we don't. So, yes, but managing expectations, if that's okay, um, uh, yeah. Felicity. I was... Thank you. I was I was just about to, to come on so I get very I'll get very excited about Richmond. I was just about to add that caveat to it. Um, and as well, we've been um, talking this week with achieving for children around that bus uh, felicity. Um, my teams, as per previous years, will be working alongside them around joint patrols um, no. with that bus. When Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, I'm going to move on. I've got so many questions, so I, I apologise. I would like to sort of spend more time on each of these things. I want to move on a bit before we um, bring in the representatives from Tesco and Sainsbury's. So Maureen Heffernan. Hi, can you hear me now? I, I can, hello. Okay. Um, so my question is really directed, I've got two parts, two Tesco and Sainsbury's. Ah. Um, you mentioned alcohol, which is clearly a problem, and there was a mention of pubs earlier, but clearly there are very few pubs that are open and selling alcohol um, because they're not officially due to open on the, until the 4th of July, albeit some have been doing takeaway. However, the supermarkets are selling um, alcohol with no restrictions in place. Now, surely at this time, it, as responsible retailers within our boroughs, that they could enforce a system of limiting quantity or doing further checks on the people that are buying these products. Um, and I mean, Richmond currently doesn't have um, a scheme like Best Bar None, but it's certainly something that, that works in other areas where retailers of alcohol go through audit processes in terms of their checks and their procedures um, to to make sure that um, they are conscious of who's buying what and limits are put in place. So I'd like to hear Tesco and Sainsbury's uh, response on that. And um, my second point goes back to the dispersal orders. Um, and it was mentioned that, you know, that they are only 48 hours. Um, and obviously Richmond is looking to review that. But what can we do as 
um, constituents to help um, support it becoming a preventative power. For example, could we write to the Home Secretary? Um, is there, would that be helpful for the police for us to uh, put pressure on the Home Secretary to increase those powers, to make them a preventative power rather than a, a short-term order? <clears throat> I'm going to allow Sally to answer that one and then I'll bring in our representatives from Tesco and Sainsbury's. Thank you. Well, I think the legislation is there for us to use, uh, depending on whether, it, whether it's the public space protection order or um, other police powers that we have. Um, I think that the, the, the most helpful thing from my perspective, and I know that a lot of you do this already, is to report it to us when it's happening. Um, and, I, and I know I've seen the comments on the chat about it, you know, it's reported early and we don't always respond, but, but reporting it, uh, whether it's through 101 or 999, if it's an emergency crime in action, um, through our at MetCC on Twitter or on our Met Police website, um, that, that, that's the best way to get it to us. We do have legislation to use it. Realistically, we, we need to have the right number of officers to enforce it. Uh, there's, there's no good having all the great legislation in the world if we don't have enough officers to, to um, actually come and do anything about it. And that is equally frustrating for you as it is, uh, is for us. And I'm just going to refer, if I might, Councillor Roberts, to one of the points about the Section 60 legislation. So this is the Section 60 in terms of our powers of stop and search, because I know that you, some of you have, uh, have raised concerns about uh, people carrying knives. So. Um, the police can authorise a section 60 authorisation that says we can stop and search somebody without having specific grounds for it. Normally we have to be very clear that we have reasonable grounds to suspect they're carrying a knife or carrying drugs or stolen property. A section 60 is when we have so much intelligence that serious violence is likely to occur. We can put that preventative power in. I, I just want to be really clear with you that is not appropriate uh, in, in the main for what we were talk, what we are talking about here uh, this evening. Um, it would be a disproportionate use of our powers to put in a section 60 now for, for the evening in Richmond, uh, Riverside, Richmond Green, Richmond Hill, uh, so that we could search people coming in. We, we do it if we have really good intelligence that it's going to be a gang fight with knives or there is going to be uh, you know, potential serious violence. Uh, so I just, again, I just want to manage your expectations. We want to use all our legal powers and we want to be audacious in doing it, but we, we have to balance it with proportionality and policing with consent. Um, and uh, that's, I hope that answers that, that question on the, um, on the chat. Okay, I may have jumped the gun slightly when I mentioned Sainsbury's, but um, I saw an email earlier today where, um, uh, Martin Smith from Tesco said that he was now Martin Smith are you work Martin is that your identity on the thing we're going to unmute work Martin for a moment and if that's you Martin yeah hello Councillor Roberts hello. I, I think it would help uh, and, yeah. and thank you very much um, for allowing us to come on but my colleague Claire De Silva most probably would be better placed um, just to uh, answer the current questions, if that's possible. If we could, yeah. there, if that's all right, and and I'll and I'll come back if there's anything else I can I can add. Sure. Would you mind telling us what role you have at Tesco? Yeah. So um, um, for for the local uh, store, um, I think I think Kieran and Sarpreet, the store manager of have been working locally um, yeah. but my role is across the whole of London so very very similar to uh, um, uh, the inspector was talking about and um, the reason I came on is because you know obviously we know that this isn't an isolated incident in our parks uh, and open spaces uh, and therefore just trying to coordinate and support the store team in, in, in whatever we can do not, not just in this site um, but, but across, across the, all of the London boroughs. Excellent. So, so and, and Claire, what's your role? Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? I can. 
Great. Um, so thank you also for, uh, for having us on the call. Um, I actually look after a community um, for the whole of the UK. Um, so this was brought to our attention um, this week. Um, and I do believe we have been in contact uh, to try and um, understand a little more about the issue, which um, quite clearly from the feedback that we've had on the call today is now, as you quite rightly said, uh, councillor becoming um, be becoming very clear um, and I would be very grateful to um, to really understand um, a little more about how as retailers across the area um, we would be able to support you uh, in the best possible way that we can um, we take obviously this issue incredibly seriously um, recognize the fact that antisocial behavior is clearly a problem across uh, the borough, not just um, in this one particular part that I think we were referring to around, uh, a bit, we were being uh, referred to around Richmond Green. Um, somebody did actually mention a little earlier on around um, alcohol sales, um, some of the promotions that um, I believe are in store that we work very closely across the country to monitor. We ensure that um, we are encouraging antisocial behaviour within our stores. Um, and we would always encourage any customer who is using our services or purchasing alcohol, as is the requirements of our license, to behave responsibly. Um, we have already put up some new signage at the tills, which I know is low level, but with absolute acknowledgement of the issue that we find um, before, our, before us here. Um, and we are also working behind the scenes with our licensing team to understand what else we can do to support you with the issues that you have raised on this call and will continue to do so. Okay, um, one of the difficulties of these sorts of meetings is in order to keep a sense of um, order we have to mute everybody and I know that there would, if, if this was a public meeting held in the church hall there would now be an absolute hubbub of that I can see the nodding heads going on around this on the thing. I mean, how? I mean, I'm sorry to give you a hard time on this. I, I, and I do. I am genuinely grateful that you've raised your head above the parapet and come onto the call because I, I, it is appreciated. But I mean, for example, I mean, Nick Saunders, who I hope is on this call, has been doing an absolutely sterling job in contacting the various supermarkets. And uh, emailing to, he's emailed Martin today and talking to Kieran, all of, you know, all of the guys that are doing it. I mean, for example, one of the things which he's raised is that the, the, the big, um, big fridge that you would automatically see as you go in outside of lockdown, which normally would be absolutely crammed to the gunnels with prawn cocktail sandwiches, is now absolutely awash with booze. And it's and not only is it washed with chilled booze, it's piled high on each side with cases of cider and cases of beer. Now, there has to come a point, surely you'd agree, where a responsible retailer needs to look at the scenes that we've had on Richmond Green for at least the last week, looks at what is going to happen over the next week and thinks to themselves, actually we're going to take that promotion down and we're going to stop promoting booze right at the front of the store i know that there are certain problems that we would have with you know the responsible drinker and the, maybe the family drinkers the people who would just want to have a little barbecue at home in the garden with their kids but surely you would agree that stacking you know pile it high sell it cheap is a completely irresponsible um marketing tool in this situation mm. Hello? So, right. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, if I can just iterate my position, and I completely take your comments on board. As I said in my previous commentary, we are working um, behind the scenes uh, with my colleagues in the licensing team to understand what those issues are. I can't, unfortunately, and I wish I could, comment uh, from, um, from a perspective of what our marketing teams are doing promotionally. I do know that those promotions that you, uh, that you refer to here uh, will be in place across the country. Um, we don't necessarily have the mechanism by um, being able to 
uh, sort of geo target, if you like, um, promotions according to the certain areas that, that we find our stores in. It, it is a, a across the board. Um, but we are doing what we can to understand how we can work with you to support the issues that you have here. Um, it's not really for me to say on this call now what the solution will be to in that respect, but I will do my best to take the um, commentary that you have given, as I've said, um, feed that back and come back to you with a solution um, that we hope we can work with you to achieve. Okay, I'm not sure whether this is going to work on, on this sort of Zoomy call, but here's a picture which you can see. I mean, that's, that's the length of my iPad of, of cider. Magnus cider, £3.75, but with a very well, with a small little laminated sign, please picnic responsibly and take your rubbish home with you, which is a nice message. Thank you very much. Help keep this area beautiful for everyone. It's, it does seem ever so slightly as though that's just there as a sop that'll keep the council and residents quiet. Uh, Leader, maybe uh, Nick Stevens. Oh, uh, Nick Stevens. Uh, Nick Stevens is our head of licensing. He's in on this call and he may have comments to make. See, we also have the, um, the licensing manager from Sainsbury's, Joanne Sergi, on the line ah, as well. Excellent. Good. Um, so, uh, from our perspective, clearly there are, there are the four licensing objectives that any premises that sells alcohol needs to adhere to. So that's the uh, prevention of crime and disorder, uh, ensuring public safety, prevention of public nuisance and protection of children from harm. Now, clearly there needs to be an evidence base to demonstrate that a premises is breaching uh, those particular objectives or breaching the conditions of their license. Now, certainly the, the opinion of our licensing officers is we don't have that evidence. Um, generally, if there was evidence in place, it would be for the police or another responsible authority to raise an objection. Uh, to make a representation against a license and then a uh, hearing would be convened. But it's not just those responsible authorities that can request a licensing hearing. It can also be done by members of the public if they wish. Um, but clearly there needs to be a strong evidence base to link uh, the sales of alcohol from a premises to a breach of those licensing objectives. Thank you, Nick. I mean, obviously the council doesn't wish to use you know, such tools that we have at our disposal. What we would far rather, and every, everybody on this call would much rather have, and uh, I'm not sure, did you say we got somebody from Sainsbury's? Nick? Uh, yes, I believe we do. Sorry, I'll just check the name again. It's on the, the list. Joanne Sergi, is that correct? If, if, if our... Um... Yes, hi, it's Joanne. Excellent, hello Joanne. This is, uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry to also now bring you in on this and, you know, bring you into Sir's office, but it, it, can, I, can I, sorry, yeah, you can. Um, it's Sir Guy, not Sir Guy, Sergei. sorry about that. Apologies. Um, um, <clears throat> firstly, uh, firstly, um, I'd just like to apologise. Um, Mr Saunders and yourself have mentioned that we haven't been in contact. Um, we have been trying to get hold of someone to talk about this. Um, I, re I literally got Mr Saunders' email um, to our CEO at 20 to five this afternoon. So um, <laughs> I know the mayor went into storm Wednesday and we contacted his office and um, we were told to speak to Helen Clark, licensing officer. Yeah. Um, and we, we sent an email to her and Angela Ivy at the tourism and events office. Um, and um, we've had no contact from either of them. So um, my apologies if we've not been in contact, but we have been trying. Um, with regards um, restrictions, I mean, I don't, you've already said it, there's lots of issues going on in and around London. We've been speaking to police at Kensington and Chelsea about the events that have happened there over the last couple of days. We um, have some stores that are restricting the sales of alcohol over in Westminster and Lambeth because of the demonstrations this weekend. So we are willing to work with you. Um, we just need to know what you want from us. Excellent. Well, I can offer you this, that if you look on the council website, you will find my personal email account, cwlr.groberts.richmond.gov.uk. If you email me, and this goes for Tesco as well, then I will be happy to facilitate a conversation between you and residents about how we can best take this forward. Because we do need to take this forward. 
Stopping of promotions will be a start. Limiting the, the alcohol which can be sold will also be a start. And don't forget that the borough has got extensive experience of um, restrictions and working with supermarkets to impose restrictions owing to our, the, um, the uh, proximity of Twickenham Stadium. Come, come, come and see how it looks on Army and Navy Day. We know about restricting alcohol sales. And so we have got we, a life condition for that, particularly yeah. for that day and for matches, rugby I matches. Know, but what, what residents now are dealing with is Army and Navy Day on Richmond Green on a daily basis. And we need to make sure that they, that it's not. That's fine. And, and working together, because I don't, I just, I don't, I don't want to give you all our time. Not fair. Um, but we do need to find that there is going to be some give and some take. And I think the first thing that could be done from everyone, from both retailers that are on this call, is to is to dial down the promotions. And I mean, we also, I mean, you could only buy one to one bag of toilet rolls uh, recently. Limit the number of packets of alcohol or cans of alcohol that can be purchased by any one particular person. And that would help a lot, I think. I mean, it's not going to stop everything. They'll just keep coming back and forth and shuffling. But at least it will stop um, the, the ability to buy in, in quantity, which is fueling some of the behavior that we've seen. So thank you very much for coming on. Do stay on the call because, you know, you, you never know. It's, it's, like, it's like bullseye. We might come back to you a bit later. So what I want to do is now keep going through all of the questions. And that we've got. So when we last um, had a question, it was Maureen Heffernan. And now we've got Anne Picard. Uh, question, is it possible? Well, Anne, if you're on the call, you may ask yourself. Okay, I I'll ask it. Uh, the question is, is it possible to patrol problem areas such as Richmond and Riverside between the hours of 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., which is when we believe it's reasonable that we can expect that we can enjoy peace in our own homes? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, obviously, Sally's not going to tell you precisely when her officers are going to be deployed, and I can't tell you precisely when our park guard team are going to be deployed because we don't want to give the game away. However, I think that it is perfectly reasonable to accept that you may find park guard or police officers around during those times. Yeah, we, have, I, we have officers on, on, on patrol in the, in the very late shifts as well, in yeah. addition to the emergency response to the 24 hour, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so, uh, sorry about this, this is a, uh, um, no, ta, 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 ta. Hazel Graham, question. Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask about the, the town centre in general, because yes. it's, it's not just the green, it's the riverside, obviously, and it's the terraces, it's the hill, and we live in the town centre, and this has been an ongoing problem for a while, but I think since everybody's been let loose and there are no pubs and bars and restaurants open, it's just exacerbated the situation. What I'd like to ask is, you know, how we can keep the especially the roads nearby the town centre safe, especially if we have, you know, young adults living at home. Uh, for example, I have teenagers and I'm now worried about them going out at night. So in, in, just in case that they come into any kind of issues, because we have noticed quite a lot of gang behaviour and drug dealing basically outside our house. And like one particular participant has mentioned about, you know, urinating in the street. I, you know, I leave my house and there's about six people using the street as a urinal, basically. Yep. So it's just keeping our young adults safe as well. Thank you. One for Sally or Rebecca there, I think. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, I hear what you're saying about um, uh, drug dealing. Um, and, and the antisocial behaviour that is, is urination. There are, uh, I saw somebody else on, on the chat bar had put, is, is this people coming from Richmond or are they people that live in Richmond? And is it not possible to find out what they're organising so that we stop them coming? Um, yeah, that's, uh, we, we want to have that, that a mixture of visible policing and proactive preventative work, uh, doing uh, covert operations against drug dealers, whether it's the, the street level dealers, um, stop and search, taking down drugs lines that 
that serious organised criminals run. It affects every borough in London now. It's, um, it, it, it does affect every part of London. Um, so it's all, it's all part of how, how we respond with our neighbourhoods response and uh, CID proactive teams that are taking the intelligence that you give us about drug dealing um, and getting warrants, making arrests, um, doing uh, covert purchase operations, so undercover policing. And we do that all the time. We do as much as we can because we know how A, antisocial uh, drug dealing is and B, how much it links to, to violence. And, and, and of course, what we've seen in London over, over the last um, 18 months is, is an increase in um, particularly serious youth violence. Mm. Uh, significantly lower in Richmond than in many other parts, but I, again, I am not at all uh, complacent about the fact that there, you know there, there is there is um, crime and antisocial behaviour here, as you were saying. So, um, and our patrols are, are there to prevent that and to deal with it and respond. Thank you, Sally. I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to start rattling through. So I see, I see we're at six o'clock, and um, of course, it's it, this is this is. Um, the, the busiest night for both <laughs> Sally and Rebecca. We want to make sure that we get as many questions before they, I mean, they, they've already very kindly said that they'll be here for the duration of the call, but in case they get called away. So, um, Anya Singer. Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you, thank you for hosting this call. I wondered, uh, Sally has somewhat uh, answered that already, but Brixton and Notting Hill were both mostly people that were not local, same in Richmond. I wonder what could be done to actually stop those people from coming in the first place. Would it be a possibility to close the car parks, for example, after a certain time? Yeah, from the police side, we scan all the time to gather intelligence about where are these gatherings, raids, parties happening, and to do what we can to stop people coming. Um, it's really hard, but we, we, we're actively doing it all the time. Um, where, there, where we can uh, restrict access, then, then clearly that's sensible to do it. But a, a large part of the problem is actually not knowing. Yeah, and you, I, I think it's also fair to say that part of, part of it is, is, is to have these enhanced presences, whether it's of Park Guard, whether it's of the police, to, to give people the very clear um, message that, you know, to, to, Richmond's not the soft, easy target to come, come and have a bit of a party and then ease up. Uh, what we are trying to do from the council point of view as well is to increase our comms largely on issues such as um, uh, Facebook, Nextdoor, stuff like that. And I appreciate that the vast majority of the people aren't going to, you know, who, who come and behave like this aren't going to be uh, paying much attention to council press releases. But if we can get the word out there that there are increased police presence, there are increased car guard presence, that we are coming down hard on antisocial behaviour, then one hopes that they will go elsewhere. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a guarantee, but one hopes. But we'll do our best. Mr. Juba, Graham Juba, hello, where are you? Can you hear me? I can, hello. Uh, Sally, I hear everything you said in your opening remarks, and thank you for your honesty. But clearly, and you admit you're being reactive due to lack of resource and not able to be proactive to prevent the build up during the afternoon and evenings that leads to the antisocial behaviour because it is a, a build up. Um, so, if the PM, Home Secretary, and Mayor of London were in this meeting, what would you say to them? And what would be on your wish list to ensure that the sizable contribution we Richmond taxpayers pay towards policing is spent, is spent on policing in our borough and not directed to deal with issues in other boroughs? For example, can we have our police station back? Um, so Councillor well, Roberts, just one question for you. Hello. Uh, public toilets. Yeah. Well, can we come on to toilets in a bit? Let's keep, let's keep on police five for the moment and then we can come to public toilets. Um, so thank you for the question. I'm politically neutral, obviously. Um, I wish that we had more police officers on the Southwest Command Unit. Um, uh, I have c consistently made the case uh, for that. Um, however, I, it's my responsibility to do the best I can with them. Um, the lockdown is very difficult to police. Um, back to Councillor Roberts. 
Absolutely. Um, I'm going to, I, I have no doubt, Mr. Drew, but the toilets are going to come up. What I would ask anybody who's on this call to do, and, and this is not in any way to try to, you know, divide a resource, it's, it's to increase the resource. There is a campaign which has been run by the local board councillors, it's been taken up by Sarah Rolney, and I'm, I'm, the council is supportive, which is to have a Richmond Town Centre police team and if we can keep banging that drum, what I don't want to see, of course, is that you know, officers from other safer neighbourhood teams get, get taken away to create that. It would be an, an additional resource with new members. So I would say, I, I, I know that Pam and Peter and Bill will be more than happy to give you the details of that campaign that they're running. And Sarah will be happy to give you a copy of her letter. We need, long and short of it, it's what Sally Carr says, we need more police. We need to get back before to the figures that we had before we had these monstrous cuts. End of the part. I think, you didn't I, say um, that, Sally, the, I know that. <laughs> The point on Richmond Police Station as well, yeah. um, it, it, it was closed and sold due to austerity. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. Um, I listen all the time to, to what people yeah. say about, you know, we don't have a base. We, we used to have over 400 police bases across London. We now um, have fewer than 200 and it will further reduce I was hopeful of growth of police officers, and, and I was hopeful that we would be getting more neighbourhood officers, but, but, but because of the impact of, of the um, recession now, because of coronavirus, I, um, I am not as optimistic as I was, but I don't know. We've had some growth, and we have got more officers, and we're doing proactive violence suppression work, um, but I, am, I can't give any guarantees at all about when more officers will, will come. And I know that. Sally. Uh, and we will come back to the issue of toilets, Mr. Drew, at some point. Promise. Um, let me see. So, Adams. Sorry just to say Adams. It sounds terribly implied, but um, that's all I have on my thing. No. Okay, Steph P. Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you for hosting. Uh, I'm one of the oh. young people here. Um, I just wanted to mention that, so we live behind the bus station, Richmond bus station. Oh yeah. And um, we've been getting a lot of violence at the, the bus stops in, in the bus station. It's an open area, so we can see very clearly kind of what's going on, but there's been a lot of uh, noise, a lot of um, music going on um, and fighting that we've had to call the police for multiple times. Um, and the other thing is that the bus drivers are putting their alarms on that are like the, uh, uh, we're under attack, please call 999 quite a lot. Um, so I'm a bit concerned about the safety for the, firstly for the bus drivers and also the safety around the area of the bus station for, for all the residents and, and late at night, early in the morning, um, being disturbed. Obviously all the residents around here don't want violence outside. Would, would that be a, would, would bus stations and stuff like that come under BTP, Sally, British Transport Police, or is it a local uh, police matter? Uh, no, the bus station in Richmond would be um, the Metropolitan Police, our, our, our roads and transport. We work closely with them, but to, to be honest, we work with British Transport Police as well. I, I wasn't aware of the specific issue of the, the bus drivers being um, targeted, but we'll, we'll certainly look at that. Uh, I know, know Rebecca has good contacts with, uh, with colleagues in those, those areas. Okay, thanks for raising the point. I mean, yeah, is it... Throughout all of this, this is the first I've heard about um, Richmond bus station, so it's a useful um, intelligence gathering exercise. So thanks very much for that, Steph. Um, let me see, uh, Margaret Morrison. No, so so the, not everybody can stay the, the full distance, that's understandable. Judith Patton? All right, third time lucky with Barry May, Richmond Society. Are you there, Barry? Hello. 
Thank you, Gareth. Um, Hello. The, the message we're getting loud and clear is that we're not going to get a cop shop back in Richmond at any time. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a, a, a permanent presence. It could be a mobile one, as has been suggested earlier, on the green or by the riverside or, or in some other such place. Uh, is that possible? So we do community contact points every week, which is not what you're saying, I know. So the, the ward officers in normal times are available. We, it's very unlikely that we would be able to uh, secure uh, a, mo a, a, a mobile police station. There are very few of them. Um, it, it, our estate is, I think it will shrink further. I, I wish I could be more optimistic with you about it, but they've made tough decisions around officer numbers, number of buildings, uh, etc. I, I, I know what an emotive and important subject it is um, for residents of Richmond. Um, but I don't want to uh, make any um, promises that that aren't achievable. But when we have the May Fair on Richmond Green each year, you bring out a, a, a police um, display unit and you have lots of people there handing out leaflets and so forth. Where does that go when it's not in Richmond? Uh, they, yeah, they go, they're in, there aren't very many of them and they're, they're in use all the time. So this is around across London. We have to go to Hendon to get the, those those vehicles that so we, we just you know we don't have our own local supply um uh, we're, obviously we'll we're, we will explore we want to improve visibility in, in terms of making it easier for you to, to access us um and, and i appreciate that doing it online is not an acceptable way for everyone and of course there isn't that that, that presence that is a deterrent so um we'll, we'll look at that but I, I i'm not sure that you know i know that we tried to get a um a, a porter cabin uh, when we were doing a referred mission at another police station, uh, at, we, we just couldn't get one and it wasn't for logistical problems, there just weren't any. Okay, I mean, personally, I've, I've always hankered after the um, Earl's Court police box, which they had and was supposed to be rolled out, but the, the BBC, apparently, now claim copyright on the, on the TARDIS shape. <laughs> the, the, the police don't own it anymore. Which, ah, but there we go. I, I, I agree with you, Barry. I would like to see some form of permanent a deterrent. I mean, even, even just a bit of fashion blue lamp. Exactly. Some I, visibility, I, visibility yeah. Gareth. Is, yeah. Uh, but I do take Sally's points entirely about the, the, the resource issue and the fact that you know, the, the police estate has been whittled away, whittled away, whittled away over successive years. So uh, it, it's, it's as frustrating for her. She can't say this. I would say it's frustrating for her as it is. Thank you. Um, Michael Ingle, is this is question one of, I hope it's question one of one, Michael, because we, we got a, a, a large queue. Oh, I can easily do one of one. Uh, yes. Sure. Uh, I have a lot of experience in this. I have a lot of Manchester. I have a lot of Leeds. Uh, we work with the our local police there. We have sort of similar areas at Richmond uh, Green at, in... Um, Highly dense populations where, where some, some afternoons we get 45,000 people. We ban alcohol, we ban music, uh, we have sort of particular areas that are cordoned off uh, for alcohol and we disperse it at nine o'clock, at ten o'clock. Uh, uh, we have zero tolerance uh, and we, we do that because we're our own, our own security company. I've been living on Richmond, Richmond Green now for two years. I've actually moved on a lot of people over the last uh, two months. Uh, the disco cars, um, a balloon are blowing people. Um, I've actually personally called the police uh, 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 at least three times. Um, and I would sort of conclude that here in, in, in Richmond, it'd be very hard to ban alcohol is because you've not got a confined space. But actually what you can ban uh, immediately as a trial is, is, is music. And all the incidents that I've, I've seen and I've witnessed, and I've also uh, I got involved in actually sort of move people along because uh, quite often I've, I've actually, actually, actually called the police and they haven't arrived for whatever reason. Uh, is music and music is 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 the it, it, it's it's 
actually one of the biggest causes after eight o'clock is sort of people uh, still being around. Okay. So, and, 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 and I, I think what, what you've talked about on this call is really hard to people and I think it's very hard to the police because you've not got a new benchmark uh, uh, to manage these, these public spaces to. And actually, uh, what was right to last year, I, I, I just really don't think it's right this year. And I think you've got to change your benchmark. Okay, Michael, this, it was a bit muffled right at the beginning and you, you gave some credentials about what your background was and I didn't catch that. I'm sorry, I'm a big estate owner in, big... in Manchester and Leeds. So I own a lot of those cities. Um, so I'm, I'm actually a very, very familiar with this. It's, it's a meat and drink to me. Okay, um, Paul Chadwick is on the call. He's our environment director. Um, he will be able to tell us what powers we have regarding the playing of music. I, I would, I would um, add barbecues into that, to be honest, because I mean, that, that's not um, relaxed enjoyment of the green in my ex. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think essentially, I haven't got the full PSPO here, but I've got several aspects of it, or the call of articles. And there's at least one of the ones in front of me that could could be used for that uh, against noise, as it were, which is essentially nuisance to use as a parks and open spaces. So no person shall intentionally annoy any other person. It's that kind of article that we can use. I, gu I guess really though, the issue is um, you know about striking the right balance between mm. enforcing that and the uh, and what might result from that enforcement. And uh, so it's, it's not necessarily straightforward. I'd like. Sally's view on that really as to whether you know going hard on that actually in the round is the right approach. But yeah, we have the, the legal tools there. Uh, we could issue FPNs against noise, I think, based on that article, if we thought the right thing in the round. Could I, could I come in? Who's that? Julia, yes, of yeah. course. Um, no, just following on from what Mr. Chadwick has said and, and the question about the music. Um, I'm in East Twickenham and that's just across the river from um, Richmond Riverside and many of the problems on the riverside float across the river late at night, the loud music that's played and um, it's not idyllic and I get a lot of complaints from residents in East Twickenham about the music that's played on down by the river on, on the Richmond side um, and so that question is one that is very interesting um, to know the answer to as to what powers we have and certainly I would have thought that after 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening if amplified music is being played that that would be included as something that is a nuisance under the PSPO but I would like to hear um, the, the view of, of Sally. Um, so as I, as I said before uh, we have legislation but um, if we are not able to have the officers to actually enforce it and, we, and we're not in a position to give the fixed penalty notices, then, then, then it isn't helpful. Uh, and we're working through all this at the moment about you know, exactly what, what can we do, what are we legally able to do with the conditions of the PSPO. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know, I, I want to, of course I want to address these issues that you're raising about the music and um, uh, all the other things that, that are, are being covered. But, but I also need to be realistic about, uh, at the moment, our officers are going to um, emergencies and crimes and um, do it, doing that as the priority, which is why we, we haven't, a, a, in the last couple of years, uh, with the, the numbers of officers and the, you know, the, the, the ward model that we have, with two police officers, one community safety officer per ward, um, and the whole, the, 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 the legislative um, details of the PSPO, we haven't been given out any fixed penalty notices at all. But we are, you know, we're, we're very alive to, you know, that, that one exists and um, officers are aware of, of what they can do. Of course, we have many other powers uh, that we can use. Um, and we are, we're reviewing it all now together with uh, the, the community safety colleagues. Um, but I, I don't want, I want to be realistic about, um, you know, that, that you are aware of the public space protection order, but it isn't a, a, an overnight solution for us to, us as the police, to issue fixed penalty notices to everybody 
in every area of Richmond Borough that breaches anything in it because we we are not able to do it. No. I, I think there's also, I mean, I think Paul is right in, in so far as the comment is, it's about a balance uh, being struck. So, I mean, obviously one doesn't want to have um, people with, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the, the, the terms ghetto blaster. I think it's, I'm not, I'm not sure they call that anymore. It's probably an iPad with Bluetooth speakers, but, you know, banging out in the middle of the night. But then again, if we would have a complete ban, you know, a relatively nice harmless busker on a Sunday afternoon down on the riverside, not blaring music out. I mean, they would come under the same hammer. It's the same thing about banning alcohol entirely. You know, we don't, it's the, the vast majority of people behave re reasonably, responsibly and respectfully. And so if we were to ban alcohol entirely, um, that's Father's Day, for example, this, this is my go-to example at the moment, is that if we had a complete ban on alcohol on the green, then nice little family, you come along for Father's Day and dad wants to have a, a little beer with a picnic, he would be breaking the law by if we had a complete ban. And we, we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we strike the right balance of maintaining neighborhood amenity, whilst at the same time allowing residents and indeed visitors to come and enjoy Richmond because it's a very enjoyable place to come to. We need to make sure that we've got the powers in place to crack down on those people who are making it horrible, but at the same time, welcoming those who want to make it nice. And, and, you know, and that's what, that, Richmond is, after all, a load of buildings, but the people who, the, you know, what makes Richmond are the people who live here. And we want to make sure that they can keep enjoying living here. Uh, no, okay. basis, I think, yeah, I think I'd agree with you, Lita, in the, in the sense that I think the focus of our relatively few boots on the ground, no matter how far we stretch them, is probably more around the articles of, of the PSPO, around alcohol, mm -hmm. lewd behaviour, urination, defecation, all those awful things uh and uh but yeah absolutely well, let's keep an eye on that noise point i think it's a good one yeah. nevertheless and we'll, absolutely yeah um Emma hi hey um i'm actually probably one of the newest people to richmond i moved from north london in december and the reason we moved was because i have two teenage sons who are being um regularly mugged by gangs in North London and uh, offered drugs. So we've moved down here for a quiet life. Um, I live on the green and the last couple of weeks has been beyond terrific. We have had people urinating on a regular basis throughout the day. We've had girls go into the neighbor's gardens in broad daylight and drop their trousers. Um, we are having noise going on on average till probably 4 a.m. Last night, I tried to call the police when the um, sound system arrived with gangs. I can only describe it as like a mini rave. I, I rang at 10.30 because I, I try to be tolerant because I don't mind the music in the day. I don't mind the drinking. I don't mind the partying. I just, for me, it's a problem of time. That once you get beyond even 10 o'clock, it's not acceptable. Nobody can sleep. And we've had this day in, day out. I've even, I even took photos last night of the guys just lined up outside, urinating everywhere. So I tried to ring 101 last night because I appreciate there are bigger emergencies. So I don't dial 999. I hung on for 27 minutes to get through. I explained what had happened and the person was lovely on the phone. And she said, I, she said I was the third person to call about the noise um, and that they would put me on the second highest attendance and somebody would be there within the hour. So that was, I came off the phone at 11. At half past 12, it was getting louder. Cars drive up, Ubers, they're dropping off. They're obviously calling in more people to join it's kind of like a gang thing it's quite intimidating and they've some of them have got dogs with them uh, one woman even had a pram with her and oh, there was basically a rave going on anyway after i'd hung on for half an hour by one o'clock i couldn't get through to anyone and i gave up and i assume it's because of everything that was going on uh, in shepherd's bush at the time it, they eventually dispersed about quarter to two which is actually quite early um, none of us can sleep um, my teenagers don't want to go out because they don't feel safe except in the day um, but it's a quite a significant problem and to me this is criminal um, that the level of noise and the aggressiveness of it and the urinating um, and it, it's just horrific and if they can't answer and I totally at least have all my sympathies with dealing with this with the numbers of problems going on but if, if they aren't able to come last night and they can't necessarily take calls, and that was not even a Friday or Saturday, which I assume is going to get even tomorrow, will be horrendous. I have no confidence that, that we are safe and that this is not going to get much, much worse. 
Um, and one thing I did want to suggest, because I know they can't be here all the time, um, and we're just reliant on a patrol appearing at some point, and I know it has happened once before, whether the cars or vans, even if they don't have the numbers, because you would need numbers to disperse the amount of people who were here last night, for example, um, whether they have floodlights, spotlights on the cars, even if they park up and put spotlights on these people who are raving on the green and taking drugs, and the dealers who are turning up so brazenly and just literally parking up, they line up along the green and they wander on, they sell them, they get back and they go. And I'm, I can't believe I'm witnessing this on a regular basis, but maybe there are deterrent things that if you just had one patrol car and you don't have the numbers, that if you spotlight them or speak of them or do something, it might actually stop them from carrying on until two, three, four a.m. Um, because it's a deterrent and it's not so much fun when you're under a spotlight. Um, and maybe think you're being recorded or something. But anyway, I just wanted to say it's hell. Yeah. Um, and I've never prayed for rain so much in my life, which is awful. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm also um, hoping that it gets cooler. Um, I'm sorry uh, that, that you had that and you, you explained it so well. So, sorry that you couldn't get through to 101 and then uh, the, the response. Um, as I said, we, we will come when we can. We aim to come to all those cases. We want to get there quickly to nip them in the bud. You're right, Gemma, it's really hard to disperse when there's a lot of people. Um, and uh, the, the whole thing about how many people are calling us at the moment, because it's happening everywhere. I'm not making any excuses for it. We normally, you know, I check with residents all the time. Um, how long does it take you to get through to 101? And the average had been going right down and people were being answered within a minute. That is not the case at the moment. I, I accept that. I've heard it from other residents as well because of the number of, of calls from concerned residents about all these issues. So, um, you know, I, all I can say is, um, I'm sorry, keep calling us. We've got the resources, as many as we've got, to come and take action. Uh, and it isn't about what we won't do, it's what we will do. We will come and disperse, put, put dispersal orders in place. We do whatever we can in terms of deterrence. Um, you know, we look at exactly all those things that you're saying about what can we do if it's not a visible uh, police officer. Um, so yeah, we, we, we hope that this weekend with the, the um, additional patrols, um, it's scanning as much as we can, um, encouraging people to re keep reporting it in, that we, we will be able to, to, to cover it and respond. Um, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I really hope that we can um, this weekend. And I, I do, I am listening to what you're all saying. Um, and um, whilst Richmond is not um, a place that is high in London for gang activity, um, I, I recognise the descriptions that you are saying of um, feeling unsafe because of the groups that, that, that are behaving. And then some of you have also referenced that you, you've tried to intervene and then you've, you've received um, verbal abuse. And I, I want you all to be safe. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're absolutely doing everything we can, whether it's working with young people, uh, sharing intelligence outside this area, um, bringing in as many of the resources as we can. Okay, uh, thanks, Sally. Lottie, I see you've got a request for a question, but I'm trying to make time, because we're, we're now at 25 plus six. I'm trying to make time for as many residents as we can squeeze into the time that we've got available. So I hope you don't mind, uh, but I, I'd like to get through the resident questions if we can, and be still. Haven't talked about toilets. I do know we need to talk about toilets. So Sue O'Day. Uh, thank you, Councillor, and thank you, stop. Superintendent Benatar, as well. We would like to make an impassioned plea not to forget Richmond Riverside. You heard earlier that people from East Twickenham found the noise very difficult. You can imagine how we find it actually living on the riverside. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I am quite concerned that the dispersal order seems to only apply to Richmond Green because I can see that what's going to happen tonight is that people will be dispersed and they won't be going home. They will actually be coming to our home and making our lives a misery. And we do find that every night what happens is that the activity and the abusive behaviour ramps up at around 11 o'clock or midnight. And I get the feeling that people are being dispersed from other parts of Richmond and they know that it's safe, as it were, to come here. So I really have to ask you not to forget Richmond Riverside because we do have significant problems uh, as well. 
And I do have to disagree with you, Councillor. Richmond is not an enjoyable town to come to. It is absolutely dreadful walking out in the middle of the day, in the afternoon and in the evening to see what's going on. These are extraordinary circumstances and they require extraordinary actions. I'm pleased to hear things like additional resources being uh, deployed, but you have heard some very constructive comments and suggestions. I don't believe that they're going to cause an extraordinary increase in the budget. These are coming from people who are living with the problem and who are best placed to advise you. I really would strongly ask you to listen to us and take on board some of these very good suggestions. And lastly, because you do keep talking about toilets, I do think it's unfair to allow pubs to open to give takeaways and then to allow them to put up notices saying, please do not use our area as a toilet so that they come and urinate and defecate in front of our kitchen window. <laughs> Yeah. Lads, I, 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 I want to get through quite a lot um, of people that are still here, but yeah, loud and clear on not overlooking the riverside. This is, we've got um, our park guard people are on this call, so they will have heard that. The officers who commissioned park guard on our behalf have heard that. Your ward councillors have heard that, and the police have heard that. Rich, Richmond Riverside will not be overlooked. Leader, and, and, we've, and we've written a very forceful letter to all of the licensees that are doing takeaways to say you must, in effect, you must open your toilets. I'm glad to say that most of them are responding yeah. positively. Okay. I want to have more of a statement than a discussion about toilets, I'm afraid, because it's now wrapping up. Some of our officers need to get away and do things, and, you know, it's, but it is an important issue. People have asked quite a lot. Um, not, it, it's, it's not a lot of people, but it's a few people who've asked quite a lot, if you get the drift, um, about whether it's possible to put portable toilets in on the green. We've looked at this. The, the one argument which I will always deploy in situations such as this is that politicians like easy, cheap and effective solutions. We do like those. And one of the reasons why we haven't moved to put portable toilets in on the green is that it isn't easy it's not cheap and it's not effective. At the moment, I've asked for a breakdown of the costs as to what it would look like to provide six temporary toilets on Richmond Green. Don't forget that as a council, we need to put in place toilets which are A, fit for purpose, B, compliant with the Equalities Act, so we need to make sure that we're laying on toilets for people in wheelchairs, all of that. Um, we also need to make sure that they have a proper sanitation regime. There are differences between the parks the, the toilets which exist in the park that, are, that have got a long history and we can put signage up on them. But if we're providing new toilets, we have to make sure that there's a sanitation regime which goes along with it. At the moment, the cost that we've been given for Richmond Green for six toilets would be in the region of £5,000 per week. Of course, that makes £20,000 a month. We would be facing exactly the same calls for those toilets on Twickenham Green. We would almost certainly face them because I'm hearing reports about Moormead um, in St Margaret's and Ham Common. All of these places would also be re requiring and demanding, justifiably, that those temporary toilets are put in. It's a very expensive um, issue, and but expense is not the only justification or reason for not doing it. One of, one of the big arguments, and one which I hold a lot of sympathy, is at the moment we've got a big problem with antisocial behaviour on Richmond Green. Is it really the job of a responsible council to lay on laughs for people to come and you know, really enjoy themselves? Come down to Richmond Green, we want you to come so much, we're even going to lay on toilets for you. It's, it's not an easy decision, as I say to say that we, you know, we're not yet in a position to do that. Not least because the government COVID-19 open spaces and town centres guidance says that the use of uh, temporary toilets should be minimised. But if it, as I say, if it was a cheap, effective solution, then we would have put them in weeks ago. Because if there's one thing that politicians like, it's cheap and effective, easy solutions. The fact that we haven't, I think, explains why. Um, in terms of the... Uh, community toilet scheme. We're hoping to really ramp that up. We are offering, most, most companies get 600 pounds a year to open up their toilets. 
we're offering £350 to new sign-ups for the first quarter alone. So it's an enhanced community toilet scheme, effectively trebling nearly the first quarter for those people who sign up. We want to make sure that um, people who are selling alcohol are, are fulfilling their corporate responsibility, their social and corporate responsibility. Paul's already mentioned that we've sent um, very stern letters to the licensees explaining that we, if they are going to be benefiting from the sale of alcohol um, as a takeaway, that, that we will expect them to be opening their toilets up at the same time. Otherwise, we'll, we will be um, encouraging our licensing team to pay them a visit. Um, and we also need to try to keep ramming home this idea of individual personal responsibility. And we also need to remember that it is a very minor group of people that are causing all of this issue. Finally, what I have asked to do is a proper study, and we, I'm, I've spoken with our finance guys as well, at how we put in permanent on-street provision of toilets within the borough. We're looking at a few locations. Richmond Town Centre will certainly be one of them, because the chances of having another of these um, lockdown situations, particularly if you looked at Bournemouth Beach yesterday, is high. I, I really believe that we will face a lockdown again, maybe not within the next few months, but certainly within the next couple of years. We dodged several bullets on SARS, bird flu, swine flu, COVID-19 was the one that got us, but I have no doubt that we will see further um, lockdowns of this nature again, whether they're national ones or localized. So we do need to look at permanent provision for people. With the best will in the world, the type of person that's going to go and your, you know, urinate or defecate in somebody's garden isn't going to be swayed by the idea that there's going to be a temporary toilet, you know, halfway, half a mile up the road. They'll just do their business wherever they like. We need to crack down on that. And that, that so whilst I appreciate there are some people who want the temporary toilets, is, is something which is being kept under review, but at the moment it isn't the silver bullet, which it appears to be. There's one person before we end um, who, if he'd like to come in, um, I th I'd like to hear from because I, there's one person who has really been taking the the residential fight to the to the big boys, and that's Nick Saunders. And it, the the level of activity which Nick has been doing is impressive, to be frank. So, are you still here, Nick? Unfortunately not. What a shame. That's a shame. Listen, Nick's been doing a great deal of work in trying to hold Sainsbury's and Tesco to account. And also I know, I'm, I'm here. There was an unmute problem. Man. Man here, don't, worry. don't worry. Listen, is there anything you want to say, Nick? Because you've been, yeah, you've been I mean, doing I've extraordinary been, been, work. It's been good. Thank you very much. And Sally, thank you so much for giving us so much of your very valuable time because we know just how much is going on out in the, in the city uh, as we speak. Uh, I've been watching out the window as people have been circling the front of our house looking for... Uh, spots to relieve themselves throughout this entire call. Um, I think one of, the, one of the points that I think I'd really like to make in, on behalf of all of the conversations I've been having with residents is that we want to start seeing some people being made an example of. Um, we want to try and act, put out the message as a deterrent that this is not a place that you can just come and do mm. these things. And, and you know, at the moment we feel like the control has been given over to the kids who are you know, ruling the green, the, the organised drug dealers who are on their motorised, you know, um, uh, scooters, who we are, we are seeing threatening behaviour from, and you know exactly what they're up to. And as residents, all you can do at the moment is call 101 or 999, and you're waiting, you know, you guys are doing as much as you can, and we don't blame you, but at the moment it's reactionary rather than being proactive. And, and all of the things that we're reporting are things that your officers, when they turn up on the scene, can only take uh, uh, details of. Because unless they see urination or drug dealing or any of these um, you know, littering actually happening, they can't give them a ticket or they can't arrest them. And hearsay is not good enough. So at the moment, all we're doing is reporting and being told, really sorry that that happened to you. But the, you know, these guys are also, they're not stupid. They're parking themselves on, the, on where Gemma is on the far side of the green because they know that once they see a police car, the police car's got to go around three different corners of the green to get to them, and they're disappearing off through the Deer Park car park. So they're, they're, they're putting themselves over on that side of the green because logistically, they're, they're, they're setting themselves up for a quick exit, which is why this green is 
such a target. So if you've been looking in the chat, you'll have seen a lot of questions about, can we have a temporary police station set up around here, either on the little green or in the old library that is empty at the moment and used for things like voting, just so that we've got a resource. And if the problem is lack of resources and we can't pay for it, so many people on this group chat have said that they would actually be willing to put their hand in their pocket and pay for a permanent uh, police presence here that is over and above the council tax that we're paying. And if the problem is resources, you've got a bunch of people on here who are willing to take that problem off the table. So I just wondered what, what, the, res what the response is to that. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I hear loud and clear what you're saying. Um, uh, with regard to the, the you resourcing more policing, um, thank you. And um, it, I wish it was as straightforward uh, as, as to make that happen, but certainly we will, I will take back what I can around, you know, I, I do hear you saying you're willing to crowdfund something. I don't, in terms of mobile police stations, I, I meant what I said earlier, I know it was it was challenged on the chat. We actually don't have any, it wasn't a question of we can't afford them, it's um, the, the logistics of getting them, but I don't want to get drawn down the issue. Um, I think we need to be much better at, at telling you as well what we are doing. Um, so what we are dealing with um, uh, some of the some of the people that are causing the problems, uh, whether it is uh, violence or uh, drugs, etc. So we need to tell you more about what we're doing. Um, but I hear what you say about it. it we react too late that, that they can get away. And, and I hear what you say about we need to be better at, at um, actually catching them. And, and you, can't, you can't, I'm so sorry, with all due respect, you can't catch them unless you're here to seeing what's actually coming because yeah. the, the moment that we see it and we're calling it in, you know, if you're, I'm, I've, I've been calling things in, you know, and I've been calling things in probably three times a night for the last three weeks because for the last three weeks we've been seeing what resulted in last night. And, and the idea that you, you could actually potentially pioneer something within this region with a working group of people here who are willing to put their hand in their pocket mm -hmm. and pay for something that's actually quite revolutionary, i.e. neighbourhoods financing their own safety. All we want is to be able to sleep safe at night and we can't do that at the moment. The people okay. that were on the green that were that Gemma mentioned last night, the only reason that they left was because three of them were arrested. They did have a, they had weapons on them and they yeah. did have dogs with them. And we, we when when your officers cleared the riverside, they, they, they funneled them all down to the green. Then they were waiting. There was a standoff where the kids were standing there for 45 minutes, seeing if the police would react. Your officers just acted with complete heroism and professionalism to uh, avoid uh, any conflict whatsoever. And they started to leave. 20% of the kids were still on the green when they got the call to go to Notting Hill. And those 20% of the kids stayed until two o'clock in the morning and they caused havoc while they were there. They did have dogs. I watched them. They were, and they go to that side of the green where they can see the police cars coming around three corners before they, before anything happens. So yeah. if you could maybe have a, a think about it and come yes. back to us and say that, you know, we, we would actually be involved in a conversation to help fund our own uh, protection. And um, we're, we're all willing to, to, to put our hands in our pocket, it seems. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, let, let, let's talk about it. I can see there's a, an appetite to continue the discussions, yeah. which of course we want to do around, you know, what, what, what do we do um, and, and what can we do together? Thank you for your Thanks. time. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Nick. I mean, what I mentioned, I, I, I want to wrap this up very quickly um, soon, but I, I mentioned in the, that we've just done one of these on Twickenham, about Twickenham Green, by the way. So your, your problems are not isolated. Your, your problems seem far bigger than the issues we've been experiencing. But I, I did mention my friend, Darren, Rod, Darren Rodwell, who's the leader of Parking in Dagenham. And what they do, they, they have a specific thing about fly tipping in their area. And what they do is they have this thing called the, the, the Barking and Dagenham Wall of Shame where they get video footage of people who are caught doing, you know, fly tipping and, and they, they will name them, well, they, they don't name them, they will put their pictures up on the council website and say, do you know these people? Do let us know who they are. And it may be that we do need to start considering that sort of thing, um, particularly if we can get some CCTV footage of people who are doing unspeakable things in alleys or just um, misbehaving in our public areas. Obviously, we don't want to be a big brother surveillance state, nobody wants that. Uh, but you know, maybe th there is a kernel of an idea. When I first heard about it, I thought it sounded awful. But now I think that perhaps it's something we need to give serious consideration to. Okay, so I know that there are still people on the chat who've got questions, but it is now coming up for 20 to 7, and my officers need to go and do things 
I know the police need to sort themselves out and I'm, I'm sure that you've got things to be doing. I, I'm just looking out of the window and the skies are looking black, which is good. Um, in terms of this meeting, I hope that it has given you confidence that the council and the police are listening. Um, I hope it has gone in some way to explain what we're trying to do to address the issues that you raise. I cannot guarantee that you won't have a repeat of the behavior that you've been seeing over recent weeks. Unfortunately, with lockdown and the closure of all of the pubs and bars, we are now seeing a different um, attitude, a, di a different behavior model um, amongst people. Whereas before um, COVID-19, there wasn't really a culture of open air drinking in this country. The, uh, the idea was if you wanted to see your friends, you'd go to the pub and you'd have a good time and then you get kicked out by the landlords and you go home. Now, drinking in public is acceptable. It is, if I, I hesitate to say, almost the norm. And I think that we do need to start looking at how we can protect our open spaces because I, I don't want to sound like a misery guts, but I, I do think that even after the 4th of July, when the pubs start to reopen, that we won't see everything snapping back like a pair of braces. We will still see people out and about in the summer because, I mean, the, the question that they would all ask is, why am I going to go and spend 20 quid on four pints down the pub when I can spend 20 quid and get 24 cans of lager in the local supermarket? So we, are, we do need to look at how we tackle this issue. This isn't going to be something which is going to be a short conversation, but I hope that this is going to be the start of an important conversation. So thank you to Sally and Rebecca for coming along. Thank you to my officers for being here, for the various councillors who are listening, who I am sure will want to hear more from you over the next couple of days and weeks. I want to hear more from you over the next couple of days and weeks. I hope this has given you some confidence that um, I'm not the sort of leader that hides away at York House and doesn't get his hands dirty. I want to know what the problems are. It isn't going to be an immediate solution, but I very much hope that we can work towards a lasting solution. So, from me, from the police, from my team here at the council, from all of the officers, my fellow councillors, thank you very much for your time today. And I hope you have a peaceful, above all, peaceful and pleasant weekend. Thank you.